Okay, um, so we're going to continue this uh, set of two lectures uh, now today talking about uh, transcriptional regulation. We talked about uh, in the prior lecture the initiation elongation steps and termination steps, and now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how genes are regulated. So what are the regulatory elements that determine whether or not that pre-initiation complex is going to come together? whether RNA polymerase will bind that region, and then uh, generate a transcript. Uh, and then we're going to come back to um, diabetes and anabolic steroids and talk about um, why they are, um, in, in particular, why they're um, associated with transcriptional uh, dysregulation. So again, just a, um, oh, let's see, I am on the wrong. Let's go. I started on the Go. All right. So when we talk about regulation of transcription, uh, this is going to be synonymous with us saying gene expression. Okay, those two things we'll use them interchangeably. When someone talks about um, regulators of gene expression, they're talking about regulators of gene transcription. Uh, gene expression. Um, um, oftentimes, then, uh, is, is referring explicitly to the generation of messenger RNA, uh, which then would obviously be subsequently um, turned into protein during translation. And we'll talk about translation on Tuesday. Uh, and it's controlled primarily so that this idea of protein, controlling the amount of protein product within a cell uh, is primarily regulated at the level of transcription. Now, uh, I mentioned in the earlier lecture that there are all types of regulatory mechanisms that we will uh, encounter in this class associated with mRNA. I mentioned a stress response, right, where a message is clustered into little particles to stabilize it, and then it can be released and translated into protein at much later dates uh, or times. Uh, but in general, we think of... Um, we think of the regulation of protein levels really being controlled at the level of, of transcription. Now, that being said, I will give you a number that I will not test you on, but I do think it's really important for your understanding of the relationship between transcription and translation, which is that now there are recent findings that show transcriptional upregulation, so an increase in the message RNA for a certain product only predicts an increase in that protein product by about 40%. Only 40% of the time is the level of mRNA correlated with the amount of protein, right? And so it's clear that there are many more regulatory mechanisms that are controlling the amount of protein product in the cell beyond that of just transcriptional control. But it is a major, obviously, if we don't, if we don't induce transcription of a gene, you can never make the protein, right? So if I don't have the mRNA transcript, I can never make protein. So that certainly holds true, okay? All right, uh, we'll talk about Modi. Again, this sort of uh, type 1.5 um, diabetes. It's actually a type two diabetes adult, adult onset in the young. Uh, and again, it's a defect in insulin gene regulation, not in transcription per se. And so we'll talk about why there's a problem uh, with uh, regulation. And antibiotic steroids, uh, we'll talk about those and how they act uh, by modifying gene, gene expression or gene regulation. Um, obviously, there are a... Yes? No. No, we're talking about preceding the, the association of that transcriptional initiation complex, right? TF2D, right? All two. Prior to that, there are regulatory elements that control the accessibility of that core promote, right? What we call the core promote. That's what we're going to talk about today. What are the events that occur leading up to the transcription, transcriptional part? Okay, lots of really bad things associated with 
anabolic steroids. Uh, you guys probably heard a lot about these. Um, why would, um, in particular, athletes choose to use anabolic steroids? Uh, well, for one, is that uh, the usual impacts on them are things like increased muscle mass, uh, decreased recovery time. Um, I don't know if this is really helpful, but in some sports it might be, uh, increased aggression. But really what anabolic steroids are going to do is uh, enhance the production right, of products for building up tissue. So um, cells get larger, uh, they're producing more protein, um, and in the case of muscle, that protein tends to be um, myosin uh, and actin, which allows uh, muscle mass to grow. Uh, interestingly, anabolic steroids have also been used therapeutically. Uh, they can include treatment of uh, postmenopausal declines in bone density. Um, and so again, this is a, it's a, a steroid that is going to improve our ability to make protein, right, to build up uh, products. Uh, it can also be used in anemia and in inflammatory diseases. All right, so today we're going to start with, um, and similar to pretty much all the lectures uh, on gene transcription, translation, replication, uh, we're going to take the bacterial system, the, the prokaryotic system, and we're going to discuss it first. Uh, it tends to be, again, more simplified in nature but it has a lot of the tenets, right? It builds a, a nice foundation for talking about the eukaryotic system. Uh, we're gonna tackle a couple of uh, two different gene genes in bacteria, or two different systems in bacteria uh, today. The first is that of um, the uh, LAC operon, okay? And so here's an example of gene regulation in bacteria that's associated with bacterial metabolism. So the generation, the conversion of, in this case, glucose or uh, lactose into ATP for energy, so energy synthesis, essentially. Okay. Uh, and so in this particular, the case that we'll talk about, the goal of the bacteria is to express some enzymes that are necessary to use lactose. So lactose is one possible energy source. The preferred energy source for bacteria is glucose. But there are times when the bacterium finds itself in an environment where there's no glucose available. And if it still needs to perform all of its functions, it needs to use secondary energy sources, and lactose is one of those. So what we want to do is we want to generate, or this bacterium wants to generate enzymes that are necessary to use lactose as an energy source, but really only if lactose is in the environment. So it, uh, I don't want to expend a ton of energy making enzymes to convert a molecule into something that's more favorable to generate ATP if that molecule doesn't exist, right? And so we're going to talk about a sensor system that bacteria have that allows them to say, ah, there's lactose in the environment, and now I want to make the enzymes that, I, that are required to break that lactose down into uh, two different sugars, uh, monosaccharides, uh, glucose, and galactose. Okay, so very briefly, lactose is this disaccharide, and these two sugar molecules made up of glucose and galactose. And this lac, uh, this lac operon that we're going to talk about, and I'll define that here in just a minute, uh, is essentially um, um, going to allow the bacterium to make two primary proteins. The first is this galactoside permease which is a transporter, right? So this is a very large, very hydrophilic molecule, cannot traverse the plasma membrane uh, of the bacterium, and so it requires a, um, a transporter. And so galactoside uh, perme permease is that transporter. And the other is an enzyme beta-galactosidase, which again is going to, to cleave this uh, disaccharide into two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose and then it can use that glucose uh, in its uh, metabolic pathway. And you guys will cover metabolism uh, in uh, a couple of weeks, okay? All right, so we'll touch on it a little bit here, but not too much. All right, so we're gonna talk about this organizational model uh, of gene structure in bacteria or prokaryotes. Uh, it's called the operon model, and I want to make it clear that this is this model only exists in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes do not have this operon model. 
okay? We have different type of structure. And when we talk about an operon, what we're talking about is an actual set of genes that have related functions. So let's say, so in the case of, we just talked about the transport of lactose and it's pre-processing, it's processing. Uh, those are related items, right? They're related protein structures. One gets the molecule into the cell and the other one uh, enzymatically degrades it. Uh, and so those are related, uh, those are genes with related functions. Uh, they're regulated together, right? It doesn't help me to have one but not the other. And so we're going to regulate, the bacterium is going to regulate those together, all right? And, and it's going to do that by um, synthesizing a single piece of mRNA. So this is a key distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, they can have multiple different proteins synthesized off of a single mRNA strand. And that's the case for the LAC operon. It is called, so that terminology is called polycystronic. So polycystronic mRNA is mRNA that codes for more than one polypeptide and is found only in prokaryotes. All right. So if we dissect this LAC, o, uh, this LAC operon, uh, it has the promoter region, right, that we've talked about, uh, where um, sigma factor and um, TAL2 is going to bind. Um, it has an operator that we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. And it actually will generate a message RNA uh, that is comprised of three different genes. The first is LAC-Z, which is going to generate beta-galactosidase. Uh, the second is LAC-Y gene, which is going to express uh, um, translate into this galactoside permease, that transporter. Uh, and the third is this LAC-A gene. Uh, we won't cover it. It's an acetylase uh, that converts, that'll um, acetylate uh, beta-galactosidase. Uh, remember, that's going to put a, um, a hydrocarbon chain on it, lipid chain on it, that will tether it to the membrane. And it, so the function of that uh, particular um, enzyme is not critical uh, for the function. Uh, um, it's a little more, a little more ambiguous what the what the role of that is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about it. An operon can consist of both structural genes. Okay, so these would be considered structural genes: the lac Z, lac Y, and lac A. Right? These are coding for the enzymes and proteins of interest. But it can also contain regulatory genes, uh, which are controlling the expression of, of other structural genes by expressing regulatory proteins. Okay, so, uh, and we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit more uh, as we go along. Uh, and in fact, I think maybe we'll go ahead to the next slide uh, where I think this will become a little bit more clear. Okay, so the operator, so if we tunnel into the operator, uh, the operator is a sequence that's going to be located between that core promoter. Yes. Uh, no, so the top of the box, is a eukaryotic. Um, it's probably a shared overlapping region. I don't think of these things necessarily. One of the hard Parts about each of these plants is that there's always these fuzzy regions of overlapping function, right? Uh, and that's a lot of what this is going to have to go with. Uh, they're not necessarily discrete elements, but in another gene, they might. Well, I was just going to ask about the uh, colleges from the part. Uh, like, is there anything uh, in between, say, like the lack of region? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is whether there's what is separating uh, these um, individual messages, right, within this one mRNA. Uh, and there actually are sites. Um, one that I know of that we use biologically is an IRES uh, intra ribosomal entry site. Um, and so when we're constructing, let's say, synthetic genes, we want to get cells to express, even eukaryotic cells to express two different genes under the control of a single element we engineer. 
we'll oftentimes separate the two messages, that the two different um, uh, translatable protein components by these IRAN sequences, and it allows the ribosome enter in the middle, right? And it also triggers the release of the ribosome that's upstream of that IRAN. So there are there are those sequences. Yeah. Yes, no. Yes. <laughs> the answer is no. They're not usually right. So that's a great point, uh, one that I was about to get to, uh, which is that these regulatory genes, um, they, they don't have to be associated with this gene at all. Right now, bacteria have circular DNA, so they're certainly within the realm. But you can imagine in a eukaryote, we have an analogous component, which are these regulatory elements. And those regulatory elements can even be on completely different chromosomes, right? So the idea of a regulatory gene is it's a gene that's going to generate or transcribe a protein, and that protein then has regulatory activity on another gene, okay? And it can be anywhere. Okay, so in the case of this operator, the operator is a sequence, again, between the core promoter and the first structural gene in prokaryotes. And proteins can bind to the operator and either promote or inhibit its transcription. Okay, so the example that we're going to have is this LAC I gene. Again, I think it's a great point that it's it's shown in the cartoon as being immediately upstream, but it is not actually in the bacterial genome. genome. Uh, so we have LAC I that's going to create this LAC I mRNA, and it's going to create this protein, which is a recessor protein the LAC inhibitor, okay? So LAC inhibitor then has the opportunity to bind to this operator, and in this case, as the name kind of implies, repress transcription, all right? So uh, in the LAC operon, this repressor uh, called LAC I uh, is gonna bind to the operator and inhibit the operon, yes? In the prokaryotic system, the answer is no, right? So the, the idea of an operon in the organizational structure of prokaryotes is that if the, if the multiple genes uh, have related function, then they're all regulated together. So the one regulatory element regulates a family of complementary proteins that are all perhaps serving different functions in one main goal. All right, um, so in this case, uh, this uh, LAC I repressor, uh, when it is in its active form, uh, it will bind to that operator. Uh, and by binding to that operator, it inhibits the ability of sigma factor and RNA polymerase to play. Okay. So this would be considered negative control of transcription because the binding of the protein to the operator turns off transcription. The other way we might say this is that this will down-regulate, right? or you'll get, <coughs> yeah, down-regulate. So it means that we're going to lower the expression level versus up-regulate, which implies we're increasing the amount of mRNA. So we'll use those interchangeable. There's a lot of jargon in <laughs> this area of cell biology. If I say something like that, that you're not quite sure what it is, catch me on it and I'll define it for you. Because again, we tend to use these terms uh, very fluidly uh, in this field. All right. Okay, so then how is the repressor uh, then regulated itself? Uh, so it's interesting. So the, the LAC I, the LAC inhibitor, is this repressor, and it's actually allosterically regulated uh, through lactose itself, <coughs> okay? So you can imagine if I have this repressor that is binding in this conformation, so it doesn't need this cofactor to have its active conformation, it's gonna sit on that 
operator and it's telling the cell, don't make these enzymes, don't make these enzymes, don't make these enzymes, right? And I told you that it doesn't want to make those enzymes unless lactose is in the environment. So the bacteria has another sensor system that we will not talk about that allows it to synthesize small amounts of a variant of lactose called allolactose. And so allolactose is going to be that signal that says, hey, there's lactose in our environment and we can utilize it. And so when that happens, then the active form of the lac repressor will bind, uh, so it's binding the operator, that allo uh, lactose will bind to that repressor and confer allosteric regulation on the repressor. So it's going to bind, we talked about allosteria before, right? It's going to change the conformation of that receptor so that it's now in an unfavorable co uh, conformation in order to bind to the operator and it falls off. Okay, and now, now that that um, uh, repressor has been disinhibited, you guys remember that term, disinhibition? It's an inhibitor that we're inhibiting, therefore it's disinhibition. Okay, all right. In this case, this is an example of what we would call substrate induction. So the substrate, uh, right, so the substrate for with which the enzyme is going to act winds up regulating the expression of the enzyme. So LAC regulation is an example of operon derepression. <laughs> Are there any questions about that? There might be as we continue. Okay. So um, anyone want to ask how it might stop? How would this system stop? All right, because we've got lactose now in the system. So pressing is disinhibited, you're bringing in more lactose, right? Because now we've got the lactoside permease, which is letting more lactose into the cell. So does this thing have a positive feedback? Where's the negative? Can we think through that? Well, so, but the new energy source isn't in this very important mechanism. It's just that allo lactose. Not in diabetes, in bacteria. Oh, but you're right, right? So it's using lactose. So that's actually correct, right? It's actually correct. So what she said was that the lactose is being used up, and so when the lactose concentration drops to a certain level, then it will unbind, or there's not sufficient lactose to bind the repressor, and now the repressor can again uh, take on its active conformation and bind the operon. And how that happens is through the expression of, well, this enzyme that breaks down lactose into glucose and plaque. And so we're making an enzyme that is consuming the protein, the, the molecule that began to activate the gene. And this is a very common thread in gene regulation of self-regulating uh, genes. All right. So the lac operon is involved in utilizing lactose as an energy source, right? And this is what we would call a catabolic. You guys will get into this again in a couple of weeks. It's what we would call a catabolic uh, pathway. Catabol uh, catabolism meaning the breaking down of things, breaking down lactose into glucose and galactose. Anabolic pathways, which are the building up of things, and we're going to talk about those, those uh, anabolic steroids, right, as one example, are, are also controlled. Uh, and an example of this is um, stopping the manufacture of amino acid tryptophan if you have enough of it either from synthesis or from the environment. So uh, a lot of, um, uh, so some of our amino acids actually require a number of enzymes to actually create them. Uh, and this is one of the, in the case of tryptophan um, is the case. So to talk about this one, we're gonna go move to the trip operon. So this is still in prokaryotes. Instead of making those genes associated with lactose, we're going to start making genes associated with the synthesis 
of this key amino acid tryptophan. Okay, so in the presence of tryptophan, this is another repressive repressor, um, but a different class. In the presence of tryptophan, the repressor of the trip operon binds to the operator. Okay, so again, we have another one of these regulatory genes. Here it's trip R, the trip receptor, our trip repressor, excuse me. All right, it is on, it is made, <laughs> but it's made in an inactive form. Remember, the LAC I was made in its active form. So the minute that protein is made, it can bind and repress the expression of the LAC, repress the LAC operon. In this case, it's made in an inactive form. And only when we have sufficient amounts of tryptophan, right, because the purpose of this operon is to make tryptophan, when those tryptophan levels reach a sufficiently high amount, tri there's enough tryptophan to bind that inactive repressor to have allosteric control over it, right? So we get a conformational change, and now it can bind that operator and inhibit gene transcription, gene expression, okay? So we have two different scenarios here. One where uh, the in pro in this case, the, this is a, an example of in product repression. Right? So we have an operon, and its purpose is to make something. And when we have enough of that something, it feeds back into the gene regulatory loop and shuts down that operon. Another strong, big class of, of regulatory control. The other one was the substrate was the one that was controlling it, right? So when we get diminution of the substrate, then we get uh, a shutdown. All right, so let's review. I guess I sort of did. Uh, the, in the LAC operon, the substrate, meaning the affected uh, molecule, binding to the repressor renders it unable to bind the operator and allows transcription to initiate. Okay? The consumption of that substrate then winds up turning that gene back off. Okay? In the case of the tryptophan, um, operon, the trip operon, the end product is going to wind up repressing. So the operon's point purpose is to make something, and when we have enough of that something, the cell uses that as a feedback in order to shut down. I don't need these genes anymore. I don't need to expend energy on this process anymore, so let's shut it off. Okay? Most of these systems are all based on trying to conserve as much energy as we can. I only want to turn on the genes that I need when I need I don't need a lot of extra protein floating around, consuming ATP, doing things I don't need them to do. Okay, but both of these uh, types of gene regulation are negative forms. Right? They're both inhibiting the expression of that operon or the activation of that operon. All right, so let's talk a little bit about positive control of the lac operon, and in this case, we're going to look at. Um, a region that is just upstream of that core promoter. So this looks fairly familiar, only it's truncated here. Here's that operator. Here's that promoter region, the core promoter region. Uh, and there's an additional site that is upstream, in this case, of that promoter called the CRP site. All right. So let's couch this system uh, in the context of glucose. So glucose pathways are constitutionally expressed. So the consumption of, processing of glucose, those are constitutively expressed. When I say constitutively expressed, it's a way of saying they're always on. Now, when you dig into this field, you'll realize that there are lots of debates about if anything is really constitutively expressed. For the part of this class, it's constitutively expressed. It means it's always on. For whatever reason, that promoter structure is always open and accessible. And so those glucose pathways are always expressed. Okay, so if glucose is present, we want to turn down other pathways like lactose catabolism. Good grief, there's my mouse. Okay, All right. So I told you that glucose is a favorable <laughs> metabolic component, right? Uh, reagent. Lactose is less ideal, but it's a nice secondary source. So if I have lactose, but I also have glucose, I still don't want to expend all that energy to engage lactose, to try to degrade it, 
because I already have glucose, which is what I'm after in the first place. So this is a way now that glucose can feed in. So we have almost two sensor systems. One is sensing the presence of lactose, and the other one is sensing the presence of glucose. And they're going to work together to regulate this gene. Okay, so if glucose is, in pre is present, we want to turn down other pathways, uh, like the lactose catabolism. If it's absent, we obviously want to turn those things up. Okay, all right. So uh, a catabolite regulation protein, or CRP, uh, is a lac activator. So instead of a repressor, we have an activator in this case. So the engagement of this system would upregulate uh, the expression. Uh, and it's going to do it through this secondary messenger. You guys talked about, I think, this particular secondary messenger in signaling, cyclic AMP. I'm not going to go through all the details of how this relationship works, but essentially in prokaryotes, when you have a high glucose level, your cy cyclic AMP is very low. And when glucose drops, your cyclic AMP goes up really high. All right. So glucose is down, cyclic AMP goes up. That means, uh-oh, I don't have a lot of glucose. I need to try to engage other mechanisms for metabolism. So maybe I want to activate the lactose uh, catabolism system. So we have lots of cyclic AMP. It's going to bind this CRP, this catabolite regulation uh, protein. And when it's in this complex form, it can bind the CRP site. And when it's bound to the CRP site, it facilitates the recruitment of RNA polymerase. Okay, so it's a positive and activate of gene transcription as opposed to a repressor. Okay. All right, so let's just walk through. I think we have, maybe we have enough time. Um, actually, we don't. Uh, so I'm going to post these. I want everyone to go through these and test yourself. Go through each of these scenarios and see what you think you would come up with. Maybe we can post a poll or something like that. Um, so if there's glucose and not lactose, what'll happen? If there's not glucose and there is lactose, what'll happen? Here's the hard one. If there is glucose and there is lactose, what will happen? Okay. All right. Okay. So we've already gone through, raced through a lot of terms. And there are a lot more terms that, that we got to get through uh, before that allow us to begin to talk about eukaryotic gene regulation. Uh, so those terms are uh, cis-acting elements, trans-acting elements, and trans-acting factors. Uh, and they're summarized on this slide. Okay, so cis-acting elements are going to be regions that are in and around that promoter. Right? So they're cis, they're next to trans far away from, okay? Um, there are elements in the DNA that allow regulatory proteins to bind and either repress or activate gene, gene transcription. Regulatory genes themselves, right? So this is the genes that are going to make these regulatory proteins are often called transacting elements, right? So that's the gene that's going to express uh, like the lac I. Right? The lac inhibitor was would be considered a transacting element that operated, okay? uh, because it can exist far away uh, on the DNA. Um, the gene for a repressor, like I just mentioned, is one example. Their products, so the protein of that transacting element. Element is the gene. The product is the protein, right? And those are called transacting factors. So the proteins are factors, the genes are elements. Cis, close, trans, far away. Okay? All right. And those transacting factors, which are, we're going to talk about, we are going to be transcription factors, will diffuse and bind to those cis-acting elements. Okay. Any questions about, about that? Yes. So that is a trans, that's a cis-acting element, right? Because it's right next to the promoter using a trans-acting factor, right? 
Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. So the basic principles that control transcription in bacteria also apply in eukaryotes. Uh, transacting proteins, we will call them in the eukaryotic system transcription factors. Okay. They're going to bind to those cis-acting elements in DNA sequences that are in and around that core promoter. There's some differences. Uh, one is that when we talk about cis-acting elements in eukaryotes, they are much further away, oftentimes. Not always, but often. Much farther away from the promoter that they regulate. And we'll talk about how that, how that might happen. Uh, and then any given transcription factor may be involved uh, as one of many transcription factors in the transcriptional regulation of many different genes. Okay, so there's not, in the case of the bacterial system, we talk about LAC I inhibiting the LAC operon. In the case of eukaryotes, we might have many different transcription factors that help to form a complex that initiate transcription. So it's much more complex, and um, transcription factors like SNADs that I work on, they hit many, many genes, right? So SNAD does not only hit one gene. Okay? It can activate and repress a bunch of different genes. Okay, so complex control of eukaryotic genes. So here's uh, just a simple example. Let's say we have two genes that are of interest uh, for us to express. Uh, we have a stimulus, and that stimulus is going to um, uh, activate transcription of a transacting element. Okay, let's just take that for granted. <laughs> How that happens? All right, that transacting element is going to create a transacting factor or a transcription factor, and we'll call it transcription factor A. Let's say that. There is transcription factor A, there is a consensus sequence, right, for that transcription factor to bind on both the gene on the left and the gene on the right. Okay, so when we hit with stimulus A, both these genes are firing at the same rate. So to speak. They're both equally regulated. Let's throw in stimulus B. It's going to activate uh, transcription of a transacting element, and we'll call that transcription factor B. But let's say that there's only uh, the consensus sequence for transcription factor B on the gene on the left. So now we have, with this dichotomy of two stimuli, one gene being regulated more highly. Uh, in this case, this demonstrative example, um, more upregulated uh, than the gene on the right. Okay? Both get stimulus A, only one is responding to stimulus B. <coughs> In general, the more transcription factors that are binding to a promoter, the higher the upregulation. Okay? It's a generalism, but generally true. Yes? <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's because the so it means that it's, when you think about the word cis, maybe this is another way to think about it, you're thinking about it being on the same strand of DNA. A transacting element that's creating transcription factor A, it can be on a completely different strand of DNA in the eukaryotic system. In the bacteria, because it's circular DNA, there's not that distinction. Everything comes from the same. So there's this slight dichotomy between prokaryotes where it's all on one basically one gene, our one uh, strand of DNA, versus eukaryotes having multiple strands of DNA. So trans then implies, you know, either extremely distant, right, uh, or on a completely different chromosome, but not associated with that, you know, in the bacterial terminology, operon, not with that gene structure, okay? Yeah, yeah, you can say that's just... mm -hmm. But TF2D is a transacting factor, right? Because it is made, its gene is somewhere. 
somewhere not related to the gene it's actually uh, initiating transcription. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. All right. May or may not get through all this today. We'll see. All right. Um, okay. So, um, if we talk about, so this kind of gets at some of your questions, cis control elements. Uh, we're going to now divide that in the eukaryotic system between what we call proximal and distal. And these are not hard, fast definitions, but just sort of back of the napkin um, for your estimation. We would maybe consider proximal elements being within 100 base pairs upstream or downstream. So there are, in fact, elements that are downstream within the gene of interest that might control regulation of its transcription. Right? But they're within a short span of the start sequence. Okay? Distal control elements would be over 100 base pairs, sometimes thousands, in fact, sometimes tens of thousands of base pairs upstream of the gene that's actually being transcribed. Uh, and how this can happen, oh, and so I guess I should say that uh, in general, these are going to be... Um, um, associated with enhancers and repressors, uh, as opposed to perhaps necessarily transcription factors. So these would be factors that are either enhancing or promoting the formation of that initiation complex, uh, stabilizing transcription factor association with promoter region, uh, or repressors, right, which are sterically inhibiting or competing with the transcription factor for its, um, its consensus sequence, right? Okay, and so how that can happen, and this is, we're going to make a slight modification uh, to the text here, um, but how this might happen, you can imagine way upstream we have this enhancer region, and we have these things called activators that, again, are transacting factors, are made somewhere uh, in the genome. They can bind to those enhancers, oops, come on mouse, they can bind to those enhancer regions. Here's where we have a problem with this particular cartoon that was generated in 2003, which is that it implies that the binding of activators to enhancers triggers bending of the DNA. So um, this is in all likelihood not the case. Uh, as you can imagine, we tend to think about and we describe DNA as this linear sequence. Right? But when you crammed all your chromosomes into the nucleus, they're wound over on top of each other. They're likely bent uh, and in close proximity to each other anyway. So in all likelihood, the original gene structure probably looks like this, right? Probably starts in this configuration. And those activators bind those enhancer regions uh, and are now fairly proximal to the region that they're going to bind. So those co-activators, these, in this case, enhancers, uh, might enhance TF2D uh, or some other, some other association of that, of that initiation complex. Okay? And we have the opposite, repressors, which may compete with TF2D for its side. Any questions? No, this is a dense one. <laughs> okay. All right, and here's one example. Uh, this actually came from uh, Kevin Jane's lab, a paper they published in PNES a few years ago, where essentially they're looking for, they're looking at a number of different genes, and they're interested in these two transcription factors, transacting factors. And we know enough about these transacting factors, many of them, to, to know what the consensus sequences are that they recognize on DNA. And in this case, um, they interrogated these, uh, this class, this sort of set of genes, and found that uh, one transcription factor, FOXO, and one a different transcription factor, RUNX, uh, have these various binding sites on these various genes. The arrow is designating um, the transcriptional uh, start, so that's usually in the, uh, the Tata box, or just downstream of the Tata box, okay? Uh, and so you can see that there are various regions where RUNX and FOXO can bind this gene structure, both upstream of the star and downstream of the star, and perhaps influence its gene expression. 
Now, I will also say, and Kevin would say this if he was if, if he was here, is that you know identifying the consensus sequence doesn't prove that the transcription factor binds it and has any function uh, in that location, but it implies that it, it could. And so he would go through and interrogate this much further by perhaps mutating those consensus sequences to try to demonstrate that it is, in, in fact, important in uh, regulation of, of that gene. Uh, that used to be called a whole field called promoter bashing, where we would literally take the gene structure and just mutate, 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 mutate. And then, I mean, this is painful, uh, mutating these genes, putting it into a cell and asking, did it have an effect? Did it not have an effect? And this is how we figured out a lot of this, a lot of this a long time ago. Okay, so we've got about eight minutes. We might be able to squeeze all this in. Um, so let's get back to diabetes and anabolic steroids. Again, we're talking about this mature onset diabetes of the youth or MODI. And what I want to highlight is that about 75% uh, of this of patients in this um, this disease category have defects in this protein called HNF. And so we're going to talk about what that is and, and how it might impact this disease. Okay, so MODI and HNF. The key players uh, that we're going to introduce are HNF. It's also known as hepatic nuclear factor. It is a transcriptional cofactor. Okay, and dimerization cofactor of homeodomains, or DCOH. All right, so HNF is a transcription factor. It is one of these trans-activating factors that only binds DNA when it's a dimer. Okay, so it has a consensus sequence that it recognizes on DNA. DCOH as its name implies, is a dimerization cofactor, okay? So DCOH is a protein that's required for certain transcription factors to dimerize, such as HNF, and to associate with the transcriptional machinery. So we have this interesting complex where one protein is doing one thing, it's recognizing where it needs to bind on the DNA, and the other is the business end associated with recruiting the transcriptional complex. And so what will happen is that HNF requires DCOH to function in the pre-initiation complex, and DCOH requires HNF to figure out where on earth to bind DNA. Here it is in cartoon form. DCOH can form this uh, homotetramer. Um, it can initiate complex, but of course it's initiating complex way out here in the middle of nowhere, and it needs to know where, uh, where to bind. So what can happen is HNF, uh, it will facilitate the dimerization of HNF, which will form that, um, what we would call a heterotetramer, which is basically a dimer of two dimers. Uh, it will, the HNF recognizes the consensus sequence, and as a consequence of it being uh, tethered to uh, DCOH, recruits, you know, sort of uh, brings that uh, proximal to the, the core promoter region of the insulin gene. Uh, it can then recruit uh, uh, TF2D, recruit RNA polymerase, and now we can synthesize mRNA. Okay, so nearly 100 different mutations have been found in HNF in these patients, uh, and some of these are on these two critical domains which affect its ability to form a dimer with DCOH. So if we have HNF, which is meant to dimerize with DCOH in order to target it to the insulin gene if we've disrupted that. Now we cannot make insulin. Or we're inefficient. Maybe that's a better way to say it. We're inefficient in our ability to make insulin. All right. So what are the treatments? Well, insulin. <laughs> if I can't make insulin in this case. Now this distinguishes this type of diabetes from all the other type 2 diabetes. This is in the family of type 2 diabetes. Normal type 2 diabetes, they're insulin uh, resistant, meaning that they have defects in their ability of insulin to function properly. So giving them more insulin doesn't really help them. Okay? They're, they're either desensitized to it, 
uh, or they have defects in, um, in the insulin receptor. Uh, we, one can give them oral hypoglycemics, so we can lower their blood sugar um, via various, various mechanisms. We can also, a more experimental methods, uh, we can do pancreatic islets, islets uh, transplants. Uh, this has been going on for a very long time, and it has it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, the dean of I know this, the dean of VCU, uh, she has a company that um, revolves around encapsulating pancreatic islets in um, alginate spheres, right, to protect them from the immune response, uh, which is interesting. I don't know how that's going. Uh, or you could do a full pancreatic transplant. All right, so getting on to steroids in the last three minutes. Wow, okay, I'm going to fly. Uh, is, um, so steroids are uh, organic molecules based on the structure of cholesterol. Here it is. You need to know that structure. You need to know that structure. You need to know the structure. Okay, all right. Said it three times. All right, uh, it's got uh, these three aromatic rings and this pentane structure, right? Uh, it's very, very hydrophobic, uh, so it'll pass very freely through, uh, through plasma membranes. However, it has a problem in aqueous solutions like your blood plasma. So it can be helped, um, it can be transported through the blood by coupling to albumin. Those of you who've had physiology might know this is the most abundant protein in your blood plasma. It helps with osmotics in your blood and will also help transport hormones. Because it can traverse the plasma membrane, it acts through intracellular receptors. Right? So the receptors, instead of being on the plasma membrane, are inside the cell. And the quirky thing about their receptors is that they're also transcription factors. Okay? So ster uh, steroid hormones pass through the cell membrane. They're going to bind to and activate or disinhibit a steroid receptor. Again, the receptor is acting as a transcription factor. So here's our glucocorticoid receptor inhibitor complex. Steroids pass through. They compete with the inhibitor protein is one mechanism. Uh, they might actually act simply allosterically, right? So that receptor may be in an inactive conformation. When it binds to steroid, it becomes activated. Uh, it can also be sequestered from the nucleus. So binding to steroid might facilitate its recruitment into the nucleus. A number of different mechanisms where it will bind to a steroid response element uh, and fire gene transcription. Sorry, I'm really, really close. If you guys can just bear with me for a minute or two more. Uh, so uh, a synthetic steroid called anadrol or oxymethylone uh, is going to bind to the android receptor. Anyone know what else binds to android receptor? Can you imagine? I'm talking about anabolic steroids. What do you think? Good guess. Testosterone, exactly. So this is synthetic testosterone with a lot of really fancy chemistry to make sure it binds more specifically and stronger than the natural ligand does. Okay, so it's a better competitor for uh, Android receptor, and it's also got some bells and whistles on it that prevent any kind of post-translational modifications to the receptor, such as changes in phosphorylation. So it turns on androgen receptor and will not let it turn off. And the response is that. <sighs> I almost put Kevin James in that. <laughs> funny. I might get back to him and it would be fun. So. Um, all right. So uh, uh, one more minute. For what genes is Android receptor a transcription factor for? Well, not insulin, but one of its family members, insulin-like growth factor. And what insulin-like growth factor does when it binds to its transmembrane receptor it activates uh, pathways that promote protein synthesis and cell growth and inhibits pathways that promote protein degradation. So if I want to build up lots and lots of protein, in particular in my muscles, then I can either give myself IGF, which has a lot of other problems with it, or I can give myself uh, a steroid, an anabolic steroid. So IGF has also been used therapeutically to treat uh, growth failure uh, and obviously as a performance enhancing drug. And in 2007, it was shown that it has a strong um, impact on even things like the, the size of your dog. So mine has medium IGF. Uh, okay. If you're interested in this stuff, 
Uh, here's a number of investigators in biochemistry and molecular genetics that are looking at transcriptional regulation. Those of you that are interested in the synthetic part of it, we have an iGEM team member here. A lot of this uh, fits into what iGEM does, where you're building basically gene regulatory circuits in bacteria to get them to sense methane in the environment and glow green or uh, detect. I had a team wanting to detect that was uh, detecting um, toxins on the lab bench and would emit, I can't even smell aromatic. So you would spread this bacteria around and if it smelled in certain ways and you knew that there was this very specific contaminant. So it's kind of